Welcome to Had a Magical Day, the podcast about Disney parks that's like taking a vacation in the middle of your day. Hello and welcome to another episode of Had a Magical Day. I am your host, Scott, along with my co-host, Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Hello. And uh, we have a, a special guest today. We have uh, David Marquez. He's the owner and producer of Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. Uh, which you can see on a lot of your, your cable stations over here at, for our Boston listeners is on Nesson. Um, and he was also a VIP tour guide among, among many other jobs he did at Disneyland, but he's going to tell us about that and other things. So David, tell us a little bit about how you got interested in Disney. Well, I think just like everybody uh, watching the Sunday shows, uh, television shows, whether they're, it was the wonderful world of Disney or Walt Disney presents or, uh, wonderful World of Color, or just simply Walt Disney. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Walt was on those programs, and uh, still, <laughs> and in color. So, um, uh, I thought I was going to be an animator, uh, and I'm not sure if the, if that show influenced it. I knew I can draw at a very early age, so uh, just hearing and seeing him, the programs, how animation was made. Uh, you know, especially the uh, animate, inanimate program, uh, you know, where they're, they're talking about shoes or they're talking about animals or whatever to make walk and talk and all that kind of stuff. So uh, from the earliest of ages, uh, uh, wanting to be an animator uh, and really <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of goofy to say this, I guess. But it, to me, Walt on television was kind of like televangelism. Um, so he, he, he would say something and then I would believe it. And so, uh, his gospel was true. And so whether it was, uh, going into the parks or, or animation or just storytelling in general or, or whatever animatronics, um, I was just like, yeah, give me more, give me more, give me more. And then, you know, when Disneyland goes to the world's fair episode, that kind of really, really sparked my interest because now they're. They're talking about it, audio animatronics and, you know, the Carousel of Progress and the, the Unisphere and all that kind of stuff. Um, then I was like, oh, this is definitely a place I need to be. Um, what stirred me away from animation was probably the late 80s and uh, computers becoming more and more uh, involved in the production. And I had never even seen a computer. So... Uh, I mean, like a, outside of like a bank or something. <laughs> so I didn't know what, like what a computer did or anything. And I think I saw the making of the Jetsons movie and uh, Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera, you know, they're on there talking about computers. Like they invented computers. I'm like, how are these old guys know about computers? And I've never even seen one. Um, and so that was a lot, that was a big distraction and, and I just didn't get into it. So I went the other direction. I went into television, but at the same time, I needed a job. So I ended up at Disneyland as a tour guide. Uh, and uh, it was quite possibly the best thing to ever happen to me, just a, a career building. Um, uh, I, I've never been to college uh, and not to boast or brag or anything, but I've, I've pretty much done everything I've wanted to do in life because of my experiences at Disney. I have two Emmy Awards. I've been in broadcasting for over 30 years. And and uh, as you said, I own my own television wrestling company. So uh, <laughs> I kind of fell into that, though. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, that's that's it, Walt and Roy Disney. Their their whole philosophy is what hooked me. We, we want to talk about the VIP tours, but what other jobs did you do like leading up to VIP tours? You just don't go into Disney and be a VIP tour guide right away. Do you? Well, actually, I did. I remember interviewing uh, in the parking lot of the Anaheim Stadium, the Angel Stadium. That's where casting used to be in this high rise in the middle of the parking lot, which I think now is a Hooters. Um, and uh, and immediately, just the, I guess, the answers that I gave, um, they were like, no, you belong in guest relations. And so uh, I, uh, we, back then you had to work in the phone room and now I know why, but then I didn't understand why. So you wore your own clothes and you, what they called it, you know, you earned your plaid and your deep end back then. Um, and uh, it was either like a two month process, even before you, you even thought about 
going into another area, you answered phones every day in your own clothes and you were not a tour guide. You were a guest relations cast member um, and you wore your own clothes, uh, business casual type clothes. And um, finally, when you were there long enough and they would monitor your calls and when you when they felt that you were uh, good enough to interact with the public, you know, then they would then give you the script and uh, for the guided tour, the Welcome to Disneyland tour, and then you had to learn that. And then I gave that tour to to pass the test back then. Uh, we would go up to the manager's office. So that's right near, if you know what City Hall looks like at Disneyland, uh, the second floor is the manager's office. And above that, there's like an attic. Uh, but uh, so you'd go up these really steep stairs <laughs> into this building right adjacent to Walt's apartment. And you'd stand in a room uh, with uh, a manager or three who back then were all former tour guides. Today, that's not the case. But back then, they, everyone was a tour guide in guest relations because they understood the culture and, and what the job really is. Um, and I had a spiel, a three and a half hour walking tour to three people with no uh, visible uh, props or guidance or anything. So you had to pretend you were walking the, the, the route. Um, and uh, if you say, um, <laughs> like more than twice, uh, you were sent back to, uh, they threw you back in the water. So you had to go back to the phone room and learn it some more. And then finally, when they say, okay, you have it, uh, it was your responsibility to go out on Main Street in this cart and kind of barker and pull in people uh, to take the tour, to buy the tour. So you had to sell your tour. You had to hawk it. Um, and uh, hopefully you, the, the person comes back at the appropriate time so you can take it out. Once you take it out, uh, in theory, there's supposed to be somebody following you, which rarely never happened. Um, <laughs> you come back and you say, so long, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And they have a big brother, big sister program. And um, at that time, that's when they take you to like a lunch at the in-between and congratulate you and put the pin on you. And uh, it's, it's some people have a very big ceremony. I didn't. <laughs> I remember I, uh, I mine was uh, we went to the in-between, which is the, the uh, cast member cafeteria um, uh, on Main Street, behind Main Street. Uh, it's connected to the uh, the plaza in the backside of the plaza in is the uh, is, is the in-between. Um, and uh, I just remember my big brother's name was Tom. We're great friends to this day. And I remember he just took his pin off and threw it at the table. <laughs> like, here you go. <laughs> so uh, most people got cards and balloons and all this stuff. And uh, but I, I did not. Uh, but at any rate, that's how I you do that. And then also back then, it was really at the discretion of the leads, um, the working leads of who they needed and how many tour guides they needed or VIP guides. And so I didn't, I didn't even get formal training in the beginning to be a VIP guide. Uh, we had a, uh, the lead on, her name was Meredith, again, another great friend. Uh, and I remember she came to the phone room and I think I was one of the only guys who had the costume and a pin. So it was like, uh, you come with me. And I don't even remember what, like what she just said, follow me. And we walked really fast down Main Street past Small World into the backside of uh, Ball Road, the Ball Road entrance, which I, is now Team Disney, TDA or TD, uh, Team Disney Anaheim. And we were waiting at the fence and I finally asked, I said, what are we, what, what are we doing back here? And it was uh, the Rose Bowl, the, the Tournament of Roses officials were coming that day. And I don't know if it was an, a planned or not planned, but I escorted and helped with that. Uh, and then uh, I was just dubbed the VIP guide, <laughs> but I don't, it doesn't work like that anymore. Now there's performance assessments and, and like a three or four day training program. And this is how you do this and that. But throughout the process, uh, as as you get more acquainted with it, and I did have to do that later uh, when I came back in the late 90s, um, I had to go through all that again. And then I did take the three day course and all that stuff. Uh, but like how to how to act at Club 33 or, you know, they call it uh, Barbie boot camp is what they call it. So they teach you how to stand and how to hold your hands and what forks to use and all that kind of stuff. So I have a couple of questions. So one on the uh, on that script, like you mentioned, it's like a three, three and a half hour tour. How roughly how many pages is that that you had to memorize? Off the top of my head? Yeah, just ballpark. 
less than 75 pages, but upwards of, and, and there was a lot of fun facts in there and stuff like that too, that you could, or answer a question from a guest that might just ask you a question, a common question. Um, a lot of stuff on the tour, I, I kind of, there's a lot of things at Disneyland you'll hear or the Disney parks that are, are legend or not true. And I helped add to that. Um, <laughs> I think my most favorite one is if you're, if you know Disneyland Main Street USA, uh, and you're walking towards the castle above the Candy Palace. There's uh, in, in, in 1950 script and art still, it says ABC shorthand and uh, maybe typesetting. And I turned that into a Roy Disney joke that, the, that you know, he felt that uh, uh, the American Broadcasting Company somehow, some way uh, shorthanded Disney in their <laughs> original 1950s deal. Uh, get a great laugh, of course, out of everybody. Then I bring it back. But of course, you know, here we are 45 years later and uh, the Walt Disney Company owns ABC. So who has the last laugh? Uh, uh, it, which wasn't true. It's it's very uh, uh, documented that Leonard Goldenson and Roy Disney didn't get along. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I just kind of like wrapped it all together. But th there's tons of that. This sounds like an incredibly stressful job. <laughs> when you started out. So you had to memorize all this stuff and then go bark for folks to to do this like this this sounds this sounds terrifying <laughs> well i mean i it, i mean if if you're like for me as, as an example you're i wanted to be an animator so i mean there's some sort of ham actor in me somewhere um you're just meeting me now and i'm awfully animated i've never met you guys so uh for me i don't think so um i understood what i was getting into uh, scripts and you know, performance wasn't that off for me. Um, growing up in Los Angeles, it's, you know, it's, it's, you're surrounded by it. Uh, friends are even in like elementary school, I had friends doing commercials and stuff. So that, that's pretty <laughs> common. Uh, no, the only stressful piece to the job was not my first time. There was my second in the nineties when I went back because things were so different. Um, there was an awful lot of Florida influence on, on Walt's Disneyland and the procedures were different. And there was an awful lot of accountability when before it was just wild west and say I wanted to comp you guys a complete dinner at Granville's at the hotel, the steakhouse. I could do that without any asking any questions. I can just do it. You know, we never would have to put our names on anything. It was always it's a department number. Uh, Disneyland uh, guest relations is department 918. So you just charge it off to 918. We had in-house charge vouchers. Uh, all that kind of stuff, just to make sure that the, uh, your day uh, was taken care of. But then, you know, documentation, that's when things got stressful, when it became, it was always a job, right? But now it became very corporate and, and accountability and all that kind of stuff. Just like the department itself, you know, I joke that we were just breathing comment boxes. So, when it came to, you know, ge uh, revenue generating when people were, especially after 9-11, it was like, well, you have all these people here and what do they do? And, and, oh, you guys don't make any money. And now guided tours went from like $50, $75 to $150. And what's the incentive for taking these guided tours? And, oh, let's do a holiday tour and let's do a Halloween tour. And let's try to figure out how to regurgitate all the same information with just a different layover. So let me ask, so like back in the day, kind of round one with this, was there like an expectation like, oh, you got to give 10 tours a day and you better get out there and sell it? Or was it, no. it sounds like it was more laid back. Okay. No, that, no. That was well, I, I mean, it was, it was laid, I want to say it was laid back because I, I went back in 99. It was laid back up until California Adventure opened. So that had been February 2001. Um, and, and that's when things got really stressful because we open this place over here and there's nobody there and there's nothing to do and things don't work and there's no shade and it costs the same as the other side and there's no characters and you know where's the castle uh, we, it's over there <laughs> um those big giant 10 foot california letters didn't clue you off at all that you're not at disneyland uh so you know trying to create the multi a multi-day destination like Walt Disney World was very difficult to get into the little regional Disneyland park that everybody grew up with here. You know, it, that was that was stressful. So going back to the easy, carefree days, not the easy days, but the early days. Um, uh, Walt Disney Productions. 
<laughs> when you first started doing the VIP tours, like it sounded, sounded like, you know, just pulled you aside and said, you're going to do this tour. Was, is it basically the same walking through Walt Disney's footsteps tour, but with VIP guests, they can do whatever they want. I mean, how does that? Um, no, I mean, there was no, there was no script for that. I mean, you had a tailor and that was all the way till the end, actually of my end. Anyhow, the, I, or, from what I understand, the, the, the VIP experience probably started changing maybe 08, 09, 10. That's when things really in Disney special activities in Florida was way more influential and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I had what was called a pep card or actually a hostess card that actually says hostess on the thing. Um, because of course, all tour guides were females for the longest time. So uh, there, we had our hostess card and we just go up to an attraction, show the card and like back door in before fast pass. Um, and prior to the nineties, like tour guides were untouchable. Like we were Elliot Ness. It was like, you couldn't any, if you saw that trench coat or that woman's brooch or the plaid come towards you, you didn't ask any questions. You just showed your, you know, you showed your, your credentials basically. And uh, depend on who you had, like everyday people couldn't take a VIP tour like they can today. Back then you had to be a quote unquote somebody. Uh, we didn't have many, what we call day guests, uh, mm -hmm. which means average people um, uh, or people with money. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so like celebrities, dignitaries, politicians, world leaders, royalty, that's mm -hmm. virtually who we had back then. Would, would they call ahead or would they just show up and expect? Uh, that's, that's a good question because I was pulled many times just to, just to walk out and go. Yeah. I, I mean, sometimes it, you would know in advance, maybe three days in advance, if you were going to have someone, uh, and for whatever reason, like if it was a media event, much like the Super Bowl thing that just passed, like if you knew if you were going to be a part of that detail a week or two in advance and they'd make sure your schedule was clear and that you were, you know, you were the right fit to be with uh, those individuals and how to deal with the media. Uh, tour guides don't deal with the media as much anymore like we used to. Like if you've noticed, probably until the mid to late 80s, that's the last time you saw a tour guide in a photo, a publicity photo with a celebrity. Like mm -hmm. before, that was a big deal more and more even the ambassadors don't uh, they're not involved either now it's just the celebrity in the teacup or something in people magazine back in the day it was you you have a tour guide and this was a big deal and all that but it's not like that anymore so david uh, you know these vip tours sound pretty cool tell us about like some of the people you had on these tours and what are some of the things they ask you to do like they ask you they can things like they can do anything they want do they have some unusual things that they do mm. or well they don't they can't necessarily do whatever they want but uh they, they you know they have backdoor access they don't have to wait in the line necessarily um it depends on how, how high profile they are too uh you know sometimes when fast pass came into play they didn't get backdoor they got fast pass so they could only go on fast pass attractions mm. um me as a guide as a host I did everything I could to get full access for people, even when they didn't have it. So uh, an, a, a person's name was in the news right now, Jeff Zucker. He was the uh, president of NBC at the time. Um, and now he just left CNN as the president of CNN. Um, I was with him several Christmas mornings, <laughs> uh, he and his family uh, and people from NBC, believe it or not, they did a lot of business. I remember at the time the tour was set up by Lucille Martin. That's the name you might know and your listeners might know, uh, Lucille was one of Walt's original secretaries. Um, during this time, she was the vice president of, uh, what was her title? She was a, she, she was an assistant to Eisner, but she had a vice presidential title and she, she basically dealt with VIPs or dignitaries and because she had been around for so long, gold passes, the comp tickets, stuff like that. So uh, the tour came through, they put them with me because of my TV experience. And it was a great time. I had a great time with him, but they, he didn't have backdoor access. And I felt embarrassed because <laughs> uh, I was like, well, here I am. I'm with the president of NBC and we we're going to have to wait in that big old Peter Pan line <laughs> <laughs> on Christmas. How horrible that just, just the, the thought of it today is just horrible, just the congestion. And, but, but he wasn't a high profile. People didn't know what he looked like. Right. Mm -hmm. So I made the executive decision and I, backdoored him and whatnot. And the funny part is when I left the company uh, and a very good friend of mine, Martin became the tour guide to Jeff Zucker. I remember him calling me, he goes, what did you do for this guy? I'm like, what do you mean? 
He goes, he doesn't want to wait in line. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't wait in line. <laughs> he goes, yeah, he just has fast pass. I was like, yeah, no, we, I didn't do that. Um, uh, Anna Nicole Smith was a beautiful guest. I loved her. She was so much fun, uh, probably because she was loaded out of her mind, but <laughs> Uh, she was a gorgeous guest. I, I enjoyed every second with her. It's unfortunate her and her son are no longer with us. Daniel, I watched him grow up mm -hmm. um, as a child to a so, teenager. Right, well, here, here's a question about that. So mm -hmm. Anna Nicole Smith, beautiful. And, mm -hmm. you know, kind, the kind of person that might stand out slightly in a crowd. So More sorry. than slightly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And mind so, you, she had, she had her E show at the time. She was on E with the Anna Nicole show at that time. She's a the height, this beautiful, statuesque, blonde woman walking around Disney World. Or Disney Very World, voluptuous. Very voluptuous. Did So, I mean, did did regular kind of patrons notice her and try oh. to come up and say hello? Did she didn't she try to hide. She time? had the most flamboyant mousers you could get. She had, her, I mean, she was hanging out everywhere and all Anna Nicole way. Uh, we, you know, when you go on Splash Mountain and wearing a, just a, a crop top or a tank top, in summertime it's exactly what you could imagine um and we had to walk around like that and especially when dca came around you know grizzly river run you know she wanted to be wet uh it was hot so yeah so people notice and so did people what was how, that so how did, did people like kind of did people mob her like what well what, that was I'm, that that's my job so that was part of the job of a vip host or hostess is that you are a buffer between uh, regular people and and vip guests so if they were kind, you know, and, and they went through the, the motions, right? Yes, people would walk up to them, but I would figure out how to bypass it because I know ahead of time because there's a detail. So we'll have, a, you know, a printout of from their publicist or their agent of, of how they want to interact with the public. If they had a problem taking photographs or signing autographs or if they're just there with their family. And, you know, that's what we would tell them. It's like today is not the day, you know whether it's a musician or someone touring it's like you know this is their first time together in a very long time and they're just here with their family i hope you could respect that and and most of the time they would um and back then you know we didn't have the phones and internet on your cameras and that it was still like it, it would be funny too when if you're with someone really high profile and you walk down main street and people start following you and you see all these people run into the photo uh, supply company coming out with disposable cameras <laughs> and then now they're, you know, they're all taking pictures and, you know, at the, if you're at a parade or if you're at a show and you're sitting, people know how to gauge it. And then they will come to you. And I always put myself at the end of a, of a row or something at a show, or I'm, the, it, it's pretty obvious. I'm the guy to talk to, or someone in plaid is someone to talk to. And, you know, if they come and ask nicely and you know that they're, that they're cool with taking pictures and signing autographs. I say, go ahead and say hi. Now, what about food? Like, is everything comp? Like, they, they wanted a Mickey bar, they want to have a dinner? You, no. No? Uh, they pay for everything. Oh, okay. Including my meals. Um, so, uh, I, at the height of when we were doing this stuff, I was at Club 33, geez, you know, three times a week. Tell us more about that, because I don't know, Andrew, have you heard of this? I've heard about this place. It's kind of like a legendary, they really build it up in the Disney. It's like the secret, it's like, no, it's not for everybody, so to speak, right? Well, yeah, it's not it's secret. Exclusive. Yeah, it's very Yeah, good. it's exclusive. Uh, and it was more exclusive prior to the remodel. And now I, I think there's Club 33s everywhere, like McDonald's, so um, at all the parks. Uh, but the original one is at Disneyland. It's uh, 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 33 Royal Street. Um uh up above pirates of the caribbean and uh uh back then uh the original entrance uh was right next to the blue bayou off to the right hand side a green door and there was a buzzer you lift this little thing up you press a button they ask your name you give the party's name and magically this door opens and you're usually surrounded by people exiting pirates of the caribbean or or the blue bayou and people are just staring like, what is that? And they're trying to look inside and they're seeing. And, and so when you walk into it, just think very Disney 60s art direction. Amel Curry did the art direction in there with Lillian Disney. So it's very uh, Happiest Millionaire, if you know the <laughs> art direction from that movie. In fact, the lift, there was two ways to get upstairs to the restaurant. You could take the stairs or there's a lift. And the lift, uh, 
uh, uh, is from uh, The Happiest Millionaire. And then when you get upstairs, there's actually a phone booth. And that's the phone booth from The Happiest Millionaire that Fred McMurray used many times. There's a lot of props from Mary Poppins, Happiest Millionaire. Uh, I want to say the one and only original family band, but that might not be correct. Um, but that's that's the vibe up there. It was very uh, oak and walnut looking. And if I remember correctly, there were three dining rooms. The trophy room was the room to be in. Uh, the trophy room was full of taxidermy. Uh, but uh, there were uh, microphones in the ceilings, uh, in the in the uh, in the lamps over you. And if you look up and you know what to look for, it's it's a 1960s style microphone upside down in the in the in the lamp. And then there is an audio animatronic vulture up above you, and uh, or a no, yeah, it was a vulture. Um, and the idea was. Walt would go to the back as he's entertaining someone like Henry Ford II or somebody and would listen in on the dinner conversation and interact and play with the animatronics and do the voice in the back and talk to the guest. But that was also a way for Walt to spy on his sponsors at the park who had influence. And, you know, whether someone would say, well, you know, that line was too long or this or that. And then Walt would magically, and of course, he never got to use it because uh, he passed before it opened. And but you know, that was the, that was the concept. He'd be able to come out and they're like, well, you know, those tires on that thing, Goodwill, uh, uh, blah, 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 and, and, you know, and try to change it and try to get something for himself. And that's why he had that. But, but, but it was a really neat, uh, a four course meal. Um, they have a very unique way, at least unique to us, I'm sure in France and other places or fancy places, they do it often, but the way they would pour water and it would just go continue to go up in the air with their arm and the, in the in the spout of the water would never spill but it would it was like it seemed forever like <laughs> boy what are you doing and then you know there, there's alcohol up there and we were not allowed to drink alcohol uh so they had what was called tour guide punch um <laughs> which was a fruit punch uh uh and a lot of us figured out how to spike it um, <laughs> um and uh you know and when a guest asks you to do something you have to uh, go along with it so there's many times we had wine and what whatnot up there when we weren't supposed to and then of course that's when the stooging happens and they call city hall and like oh, he's drinking whatever it's like yeah if i had a sip of wine because the president of albania asked me to have wine you know you don't <laughs> say no um <laughs> so at any rate uh All right, that's club 33. All right, so I got a question about this dynamic because I've never done a VIP tour. You know, so you are, you are out with the president of Albania and his family, and now it's time for lunch. Yes. And so you guys all just go up and you get a table, and then you're just the tour guide is just kind of sitting at the table with. Oh no, no. Well, it depends. Okay. How does that if, work? If yeah. they if they invite you to eat, you're welcome to eat with them. If you're not invited, then yes, you're sitting at the table empty empty handed. Um, we had uh, what was called in-house uh, charge vouchers um, to buy your own meal. And that, then that's on the company, especially if you know you're going to be out there 16, 18, 19 hours uh, without breaking. So uh, if they didn't eat or they didn't drink water, you didn't stop to do that. Luckily, there's attractions that we weren't allowed on. So any real water attraction, so like Splash Mountain, we weren't allowed on that because we couldn't get the costume wet. Uh, so what we would do is we would go into the uh, control room of the attraction and we would watch the guest. You were supposed to be able to see your guest at all times. So you'd go up and watch on the on the security monitors how they were how it was going. Um, so uh, so yeah. So we would just carry uh, and then it, then we ended up with printing out comps later, just like we would for a guest if there was an issue or or if we were going to buy him ice cream or something for a guest service problem. You know, you print up these twenty dollar tickets and go whatever. Uh, but I would say 95% of the time we were invited to eat with the family. Now tell us about, uh, one particular VIP guest that, uh, Oh <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, and funny enough, uh, this one happened to be one of those, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're getting extended. Uh, they had a mandatory extension, uh, after your eight hours, if they wanted to keep you, um, you just didn't get to go home. Um, if they didn't want you to go home. And uh, so I remember I was getting ready to clock out and um, and uh, uh, I remember the lead pulled me aside and they said, no, you're, we need you to stay. There's someone coming. 
and they didn't tell me who it was because I don't think they knew it was just happening. It was a request from the studio and parking and everything was such a, an issue. They don't do this anymore uh, like this, but the car, uh, well, the limousine uh, came in and pulled up behind uh, 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 Lincoln, uh, the, the, the opera house. And I went and I changed because I had already had a long day. So I went to costuming, I changed, got a fresh shirt, got a fresh vest because I was already smelling like a wet dog. <laughs> Those things stink when they get musty. Uh, it's just polyester and wool. Um, and it was a summer summer day. And uh, I didn't know who it was going to be. And out comes, first, came, first person who came out was Rob Zombie. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to be with Rob Zombie. Cool. And then two women stepped out completely in disguise. They had colorful wigs. I didn't recognize them at all. And then Nicolas Cage comes out. This is the first time I'm publicly telling this story too. Nicolas Cage comes out and um, like, oh, and in Disney protocol, we're kind of in trouble because for every, uh, every person who is high profile, um, you're supposed to have a guide for that person. So mm -hmm. now here I am and I'm doing two celebrities. Not supposed to do that. But anyhow, so it's Nick and I'm walking Nick around and then all of a sudden Rob Zombie and one of the females just ditched us. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Like I turned around, they were just gone. And it left us with another female and Nick. And Nick was a great guy. He knew exactly what he wanted to do. You know, we got to go, oh, we're going to go see the Tiki Birds and we're going to go uh, the Small World. Then we're going to go to the Tom Sawyer Island. Like he knew exactly what he wanted to do. <laughs> Um, which was great. And then he decided, right, he stayed through the fireworks, stayed till the end. And then he was so happy, you know, whatever. He was like, uh, can you help me get a hotel room for the night? And I'm like, you yeah, know, it's already 1130. And I'm like, well, probably the Disneyland hotel before the remodel was there. Like, well, if you don't mind staying there. So I remember calling the hotel and Disney special activities and trying to make this work. Their office was already closed. Everything was a mess. Luckily, I, I knew the, the manager at the hotel. And, and funny enough, they're like, well, we're overbooked, but the presidential suite at the grand, the, 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 the new Grand Californian is, is available. And I went, great, because it's Nicolas Cage. Um, like, fantastic. And we had his credit card on file. So everything was seamless. And we went, dropped him off, tells me he wants to get started at like 7 a.m. And I was like, well, I don't think the park opens till 8.30. So no reason to get up, <laughs> you know, and give me a chance <laughs> to sleep um, after a full day. So, you know, I send back then alpha pages. We didn't have emails. So alpha page, who we have to uh, page and uh, say, well, I guess I'm coming back in the morning. So you need somebody to fill my city hall shift. Uh, okay. So I went and did that. And then out of the blue, I walk up to the room to get him and, uh, it's Penelope Cruz. <laughs> That's who the other female was. Um, and, uh, and I didn't say anything because I didn't want anybody else to be with us. And they were, I guess, sort of seeing each other. And then news got out and then the paparazzi started following us and that kind of stuff. And it was pouring rain, I remember. But then uh, that was the first time. And then you, you know, fast forward three or four other visits towards the end of the year. Uh, uh, and they request you, you know, uh, I remember being at Club 33 with them. And, I, and Nick asked me, like, what am I doing after this? And I, and I thought he just meant after work. And so I was like, well, I'm going to go home, <laughs> take a bath. I don't know. Uh, and, and he just smiled and whatever. And then his assistant, Stephen, looked to me and he says, when can you put your two weeks in? It's like, excuse me? He's like, yeah, when can you put your two weeks in? I was like, I don't understand. He goes, oh, he just hired you for the film company. We would always talk about movies and Maison Sen and you know all the stuff that was in storytelling that was in my head from wanting to be in animation and then the the television that I've done and local news and sports and all that and I guess I was just real with him and he enjoyed you know my creative side and he hired me and I was a creative executive and development person for his Saturn films for two years um, and I went to work for Nick Cage and it was a fantastic time. That's an incredible story. It's kind of like, um, you know, that's amazing. Incredible. Yeah. And it's common. Like it's really, really common. So uh, over the years too, going back to the fifties, I'm sure this is a, a, a very long standing uh, situation within Disney worldwide, not, not just here in California, because this, this is everywhere. 
and uh, I have no guides from Tokyo and Hong Kong and Shanghai and, and Paris and, and all that. So uh, cool. everyone has these stories. Well, all right. Well, I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. So like, what's the dynamic? You're walking around Disneyland, going to see the Pirates of the Caribbean with um, Nick Cage and Penelope Cruz. And so are you guys just like making small talk? What is happening here? Are they- Well, are, sure. Just, I mean, they're just people. <laughs> Of course, I mean, of course. they're just people with a Black American Express card. I mean, they're just people, though. Um, and, you know, you talk to them like people. Like, you just, no, Hi, no. how are you? And great. And you don't even, you know, if you're if you're starstruck, I mean, again, I grew up in L.A., so if you sure. go to the Kroger here, you know, there's a good chance standing behind you is Ted Denson or, or Tom Cruise or somebody because they need milk, too. Um so it's not too uncommon to see celebrity uh, in, in, in the public. Um, so, you know, just being there and, and come on. I mean, I work with Academy Award winning Mickey Mouse every day. How can I be <laughs> more starstruck than that? You know, the majority of them are great with the public. Uh, sure. Sports figures are probably lower on that list for some reason in my experience. Mostly baseball players. Baseball players are not nice for the most part. Um, uh, basketball players, football players, way up there. They really like their fan base. Ba I don't know why. It, all huh. my experience with baseball players, it was always difficult. Um, but uh, but celebrities, for the most part, I would say eighty-five to ninety percent of my guests that I had that were actors, actresses, they were great with the public. Uh, royalty, that's a little difficult because then you have a gigantic detail, including off-duty LAPD and Secret Service and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, that can get ugly. Um, governors and other politicians, that can get ugly too, depending on who they are, especially if they're in the news at that time. Uh, that could be tough. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, mostly, you know, it, what I would do is I would figure out how to bring their Disney memories growing up before they were famous into the equation so like when was your first time and, and, Pe and penelope cruz she was born in mexico so it's like how did you grow up with this yes you had the movies but when's the first time you knew about a disneyland and you know and then you become the expert too and show them like little things that they would never see like uh the little man of disneyland house in in adventureland or uh uh hidden mickey stuff uh, and even invent hidden mickey stuff like plant your own uh, which I did many times um, to keep things entertaining or hold up the uh, the Enchanted Tiki Room so we can show them how the show starts and then bring out, we had this uh, uh, orchid that we use in the Walt tour that was there and I know it's there. So like, hey, can we hold up the next show for a few minutes and let them play with the, with the backside of the mouth and whatever. So, and I would do that for uh, average people too, not just for celebrities, you know, because I felt everybody should have that, that fun experience, especially if you're spending that much money. Did you get tips at this or did they? No, uh, we were not allowed to. I mean, we didn't. We did keep them in terms. Sure. It's, it depended on how much we got. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if it's a hundred bucks, we didn't say anything. If they if they know it's a person with a history of tipping or 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 like Saudi royalty um, or somebody like that, where they knew they were going to tip us, um, you know, you'd have to turn something in. So the rule was, uh, it's not like this anymore. And I fought for this. Um, uh, with a bunch of other people, of course. Uh, if someone were to tip you um, prior to the Disney, so back, so there were there were different scenarios. So let's say a guest parked in the old parking lot that is now California Adventure. You would escort them to their car, and you were by yourself. So there's nobody watching. Whatever, anything could happen. Once they made, uh, they were trying to show off the Disney's Grand Californian. VIP guest would go to the Port de Cochere out there in front and that's where you 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 welcome them but then when you're out there you have bellhops and you have doormen and you have all these people watching who could all take tips that's that's important because if they were to give you something and they didn't give them something it was a big hoo-ha so what the, the, the rule was uh decline three times and then accept it then turn it in uh Disney special activities at that time started doing follow-up calls with the guest asking if they tipped, which was horrible, like 
this is where I mean with yeah. the accountability. So now you're putting the guest on the spot. They already saw you do a big giant song and dance that I can't accept this, you know, and then they gave it to you anyways and made you take it. And most of them lied for us. So that was great. Um, uh, and they would ask, well, how much? Whatever. So, you know, whether if we got a thousand dollars and this is, and I'm not exaggerating, like it could be a thousand dollars a day. If they're there for an entire week, it could be $15,000 depending on who they are, you know, and if it's something like that, you know, I totally turn in a thousand bucks because I got 14,000 in my pocket. There you go. <laughs> um, today, luckily they have figured out how to do tips. And so it's tipped just like any restaurant server would do. You turn your tips in, uh, it gets put on your paycheck and they take the taxes out. But I think the big problem was having a Disneyland paycheck go out to a hourly cast member where, you know, their, their weekly pay with tips was somewhere in the neighborhood of like $4,000. And I don't think they wanted the rest of the park to see that. We talked a little bit. So I think when you first started at, at Disneyland, there were still a lot of people who had actually worked with Walt. And, mm -hmm. and Roy was still around. So there's very much the spirit of Walt Disney. Roy E. Disney was there, the son. Oh, the son of Roy. Okay. Yeah. But, but then there was a kind of this transition when Michael Eisner. Came. Well, yeah. So like, I really felt the shift of, you know, Walt Disney Productions into the Walt Disney Company uh, and it becoming way more Hollywood than folksy. And I don't know if that makes sense or not, but, um, you know, you had a pride to go to work. We definitely went to work for a dead man. Um, like I said, it was very Jesus-like. Uh, 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 he was very much alive. Um, and you work with people side by side with people who worked with him even from 55, uh, going all the way to 66. So, uh, and then beyond that too, like in Imagineering and, you know, I, I had to, I don't know how many times I interviewed John Hinch. So, you know, he goes back to the, to, to the thirties at the studio and people like that. So um, you're always around it. Like I remember, I'll never forget the opening of downtown Disney. We did the, uh, the media event and John Hinch was there <laughs> and I'm uh, standing right next to him. I wasn't his host, but I, another one of my jobs at Disney, I was, because I came from television too, was there's a thing called cast TV, which was basically a propaganda, a closed circuit network uh, of TVs uh, around the resort. And so we were always interviewing people, a lot of culture, a lot of tradition, you know, raw, raw stuff. So you, we were always interviewing Marty Scalar and, and whoever was alive, Mark Davis, Alice Davis, whomever. Uh, and so I interviewed John Henge many times and he's very candid. It's very madman, uh, you know, cigarette and whatever, just talking. And I remember as we were walking towards the hotel through downtown, to downtown Disney, and I heard him just, you know, he stopped, we were with a group of people. He just stopped and stared at the monorail station. And he said, who the fuck designed that? <laughs> who, who, cause you know, his thing is color, right? So he's like, that is the most hideous what is that? And if you go and you look at it, it's, it's, uh, I think palm leaves going over the train in the state. Anyhow, one, he was correct, but yeah. two, <laughs> just his disgust for it. And he just stood there like, and he was still at Imagineering, but he, you know, was more of an honorary title than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, I just remember him stopping and, you know, another one is Bob Gurr when California Adventure opened, uh, myself and a friend, we, we, we showed him around the park and I remember we went to Superstar Limo because uh, I wanted to get his reaction to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we're standing in the queue and he couldn't get past the queue. And I don't know if you guys have ever been on the attraction when it was around, but the, on the facade side, it, it was just like cutouts of like a map of Hollywood and really cartoony looking. And on the back side, it was just the pillars that held it up, whatever painted steel with exposed nuts to keep it in place. And the, all that Bob Gurk could do, he just stood there in awe. He wouldn't move. And I'm not exaggerating this at all. Just stood there and he goes, man, Walt would just shit. <laughs> like he just looks at it and he goes, where's the curiosity? Where's the imagination? Where? And that's the big difference between Disneyland and, and like the modern Disney Imagineering um, where it's just put it up, kind of the field of dreams, put the name on it, and they'll come. 
Well, we learned that at California Adventure, you could put that name on there and no one's going to show up. So, and that was a good, you know, five, six years, I think, of people not showing up to that site until they started investing more money into it. Um, but yeah, you know, and you see the culture shift. I, I mean, again, I was with a, a television department at times and I was in earshot of, of big executives and conversations and, you know, Roy Disney and Michael Eisner arguing over stuff uh, backstage before they had to go out and put a name tag on. Yeah, so what was the basic crux of that? It was like Roy w wanted to stay true to the Walt way of things and... Yeah, I mean, like as simple, the most simplistic things like wearing a name tag and, you know, Roy Disney had no problem wearing a name tag, but I, I remember like Eisner not wanting to wear one. <laughs> and like Roy saying, you know, we have thousands of people who are proud to wear these, you know, the, the least we can do is sit next to each other on Good Morning America, smiling and wearing a name tag, you know, he mm -hmm. was very proud of, of being around the company. I enjoyed it every time he was around. He was very real too. You know, I was with him and his family several times as a, as a tour guide, as a VIP host, mm -hmm. uh, him and Patrick and Patty, his wife, um, he was very very down to earth, you know, you wouldn't know that he was a billionaire or a Disney if, if you didn't know what Walt looked like, you know, they were <laughs> almost identical really? in some ways. Um, but yeah, so I heard it. And then that's when that Save Disney campaign started online, like shortly thereafter, those conversations I heard with Eisner. So, so yeah, Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit about Walt and Roy and uh, especially why you think Roy doesn't get enough credit? Well, I mean, even as a kid, I, I understood the dynamic, just like everybody, I'm sure, one of the first, when I was, you know, old enough to comprehend, uh, I read the Bob Thomas book, you know, the Walt Disney American original uh, in, in elementary school and, uh, and became more smitten with the idea of a Walt and Roy Disney. Um, I'm the oldest of four. So like I, uh, and there's a big gap between my, my siblings um, and we're all very different, which is strange in its own right, but we are um, <laughs> coming from the same parents. Uh, uh, just reading that book and seeing Roy's influence on show business, that's what I got out of it. I, it wasn't like Walt, Walt, Walt. It was what Roy was doing to ensure Walt was going to get something done. So finding the money, making the relationships um, uh, the networking or, and then eventually the, the, the big word synergy within the company. Um, it, I just really like the idea of this, 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 this company, this entertainment company ran by two brothers who, you know, really loved each other. And, uh, big brother Roy wanted to make the little brother, the happiest guy ever for whatever reason, you know, um, especially from the time they came up in, in the early 20s through the 30s, there's wars, there's, you know, massive conservatism in the country, and then, you know, hippie culture, and like, just really looking at that dynamic and coming from these two guys who had a very traditional background, and who were men of their times too, mind you. So, you know, reading all that, seeing all that, I just don't feel that Roy Disney, Roy O. Disney, uh, gets the credit he deserves for really inventing modern entertainment and the business of entertainment. So, you know, they didn't want, uh, uh, RKO didn't want to release the True Life Adventure. So Roy Disney said, okay, we're going to make our own distribution company. Fine. What are we going to call it? He looks out the window and it goes, Buena Vista Pictures, <laughs> you know, because that's the name of the street, Buena Vista Street, um, where the studio is located. Uh, you know, just things like that. Even going forward, the forward thinking of television that, you know, all of Hollywood moved away from television, uh, yet Disney understood what to do and created the ultimate infomercial in Disneyland. Like, uh, yeah, we're going to show you Alice in Wonderland, but first we're going to tell you about these giraffes. Like, check these giraffes out. <laughs> and in about six months, you're going to be able to see these giraffes hopefully move and do stuff. Um, and, and, and then later working at the park and like meeting Marty Scalar and understanding what his job was in the sixties, not just at Disneyland writing a newspaper, but when he moved to the studio and Imagineering and was, he was basically was Walt's personal writer. And I don't know if the public really knows that about him, 
but like most speeches that Walt Roy gave or the annual report, uh, those were all written by Marty Sklar. So uh, when he told me about how he, how he started to understand Walt's speech pattern and like words that would, that were difficult for him to say, like hover, he would say Hoover or, uh, 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 and he wouldn't remember thing uh, stuff. So he would use the word things, you know, we're going to right over here, we're going to build this thing and it's going to be the most fantastic thing you ever You're like, what, what the hell's the thing? What, <laughs> but that's part of the curiosity is like, well, we got to see what this thing is going to be. Um, and, and anyhow, that I fell in love with the with the brother relationship, not even from a, a, a corporate standpoint, just this this old guy and Roy, who I think he was 11 years older than Walt. Um, I think I could be wrong on that. He could be 14. Um, and then reading press clippings later, like around 70, uh, 69, 70, 71, going into Walt Disney World, and they would, you know, ask questions about Walt. Walt's already gone. It was like, look, Walt's been pissing on me. He, Walt was pissing on me as a as a three year old in bed together. Now, you know, he's still pissing on me as we're trying to build this thing. And when you read those articles and hear Roy's voice, um, you, there was still an awful lot of affection because so it doesn't it it, it doesn't uh, 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 go past me that he you know that it went from Disney World to Walt Disney World and and the story they tell about that because. That was his little brother's last dream. So, and he wanted everybody to remember that. Um, but yeah, so I just think that Roy O. Disney de deserves a lot more credit than he gets uh, uh, publicly. Now, behind the scenes, there's there's a whole big story that isn't out there. The Walt side, the Roy side, and family issues and business issues. And they didn't speak to each other for a few years, and the peace pipe and that all that stuff. Um, from a corporate, they sued each other. Like it's it was it's it's really ugly corporate. But at the end of the day, they were still brothers. All right, well, this has been fantastic. Thank you for for being on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you again, David and Andrea. You, David. Take 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 us out, Andrea. Okay, so we'd uh, like to say goodbye to everybody. And I guess the nicest way to say goodbye is to say we'll see, see you real soon. soon. Real soon. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed your day here at Walt Disney's Original Magic Kingdom. My name is David. Have a safe drive home, and we hope to see you real soon.